Hello and welcome to Film Flat TV. Over the next three nights we will be talking all things film with producers, directors, actors, audience and anyone else who cares to join in. It's always been one of the biggest weekends of the year in Galway and especially so this time. The focal point of the flat is the Town Hall Theatre. Let's find out what's happening there from our roving reporter Alistair Fish. Alright, I'm here at the centre of the action in front of the Town Hall Theatre, the epicentre of the film festival as always. Down the road we also have the Palace Cinema where many features are also going to be shown. The sun is out, the weekend is here and it's day four of the festival and those who know, know that this is the day things really start to kick off. There are 80 feature films this year including films in Irish and four films from the Ukraine. There are going to be 20 world premieres. 33 Irish premieres and no less than 108 short films. If that wasn't enough for you, there are masterclasses, Q&As, workshops with directors, actors, producers, and most importantly, or as importantly, there is the business side of things, the marketplace, where films at the beginning of their production or at their inception can find backers, producers, distributors, get made and potentially feature at next year's festival. Most importantly though, this year the crowds are back and so is the crack. A festival like this does not happen by accident. Months of preparation has gone into it by hundreds of people, many of them volunteers. So who makes the final call on what films get shown in the flat? That would be Will Fitzgerald, the director of programming. I spoke to him and asked how he approaches that task. But I've kind of, I was, I was describing to someone recently as sort of like, you know, starting out chiseling away, um, you know, kind of like a, a sculptor until you, you know, the program that's there wants to reveal itself. Um, because we start out with so many submissions, we have thousands of them each year. Um, so I don't really go into it with any preconceived idea of what I want any given year's programme to be. You just sort of look at what's out there, some things will fall by the wayside, some things will kind of stay in your head and then when you, you know, watch some, you know, keep watching, like they might remind you of some of the things you've seen previously, they'll come back into the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you just sort of, eventually a picture will start to reveal itself, the kind of zeitgeist of any given year might kind of, you know, appear and you kind of get a through line on, on what it is you want to sort of hang your coat on um, and, and structure a program around. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of how it, it works. Okay, so you, would, you wouldn't go in with a preconceived notion of like themes or anything or would they, they, just, they just naturally develop, would they? Yeah, they kind of naturally come about. I mean, maybe you might go in with an idea for a certain sidebar. Like this year, for example, I knew I wanted to do something on the centenary of the Civil War and the death of Michael Collins, given that it's um, happening just a month later after the fly in August. Um, so I was thinking about some of the docs. There's, there's always, you know, um, a plethora of docs in Irish history. Yeah. Um, and so I've been thinking of some of the ones that I'd seen the past few years. Um, Keepers of the Flame by Nuala O'Connor is one that stood out to me from when we showed it back in 2018. Um, given that it was slightly ahead of its time, I thought, oh, I, I, I've been thinking for the past several years I would want to show this again. Um, on the year of the centenary um, and so we did just that and then we picked some other films as well to to broaden out that program um, and so yeah I always I always had that in mind since the beginning of the year but the I suppose the sort of main program and um, and what's out there in the market you know I have no way to tell that in advance that's just something that you kind of um, you see through your research you know. so as well, like the, obviously with the Ukraine war, there's a purposeful uh, focus on that. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, again, I didn't even necessarily go in with a preconceived idea of doing that. Um, I didn't think, I, I suppose like most people, I probably thought, well, the industry in Ukraine will have been decimated. Um, and of course it has, but that's not to say that there aren't lots of um, really active filmmakers still out there, you know, it's a great thing about filmmakers in times like these, they will like persevere and they'll start, they'll do what they do, which is to tell their story and get it out there. So it was again through that research, through going through submissions, through traveling to festivals and seeing what was out there, um, that I saw there were actually quite a number of really impressive contemporary uh, Ukrainian films um, that and even though they're not all necessarily about war or conflict, that, I mean, it's even better that they're not, that they they open a window, you know, for an Irish audience and to, to empathize with everyday Ukrainian people, many of whom are here now, um, which was the case as well with uh, Yana Korolovia, the star of our closing night film, Carol of the Bells, watched that film um, and then discovered that the lead actress of the film I had just seen was actually living um, in Clare uh, oh, you know, wow. as, as a refugee. So 
that was a kind of lightning bolt moment of like, okay, well, I have to show this. And then I thought, well, if we're going to show this, we may as well, you know, open it up to all kinds of Ukrainian films. And that's where the Ukrainian, the Ukrainian strand came from. I feel something. I feel someone who believes Europe will be arrested. Це в дядька Йосипа. Він коли збирався до Америки, ховав тут всякі цінні речі. And last night we had Rosha and Frank on in the Town Hall Theatre. So how important is it to have to feature Irish language films in the flat? Really important. I mean, we have an Irish language title as a festival, you know, Film Fly. That was in the, since the beginning that they wanted to be a flat, not a festival. Um, and again, going back to the festival's DNA and its origins, it was supposed to be, it was conceived of a post-colonial film festival um, by Bob Quinn and Miriam Allen, the filmmakers who founded it at the time. Um, so that there's a, now a movement towards, um, you know, really building capacity of Irish language cinema. We definitely want to get behind that. We really want to support it. Um, we've premiered so many of the great ones for the past few years, like Fosca um, and other films like that. Um, and this year we've got Tarok, which is the latest one following on the heels of Uncalling Kuhn, which has done amazingly um, yeah. in Europe. Um, so yeah, I just want to see so much more about, you know, they would be making about one uh, a year now, maybe like one to two now with Roja and Frank and Tarok both coming out this year. So I hope it just builds and keeps getting more momentum. I think the Irish language offers Irish films a more European flavour that makes them play better on the international festival circuit. So, yeah, I hope it continues. So, just back to your role, um, what's the kind of size of the operation as the, as the film FLA is, is ongoing and what, what's kind of the day-to-day -day as, it, as, it's, uh, as it's commencing like? Um, it's uh, <laughs> paddling furiously upstream. Um, yeah, just, uh, we have 80 films um, and, you know, most of those would have guests in attendance. So it's um, running back and forth between screenings. You have these four screenings happening at any one time between the Town Hall Theatre and the Palos. Um, and I guess you're just ensuring that everything is um, being presented to the best quality. Um, you have a duty of care to your filmmakers who are here, of course, making sure that they're um, happy and um, feel welcomed at the festival. Um, that you have interesting and insightful things to say about their film um, when you're introducing them or um, doing Q&As with them. That's a big uh, part of it. Probably this, the part that I stress out about the most is, um, you know, just giving them a good Q&A because that's the whole, it's the festival element that we've been missing for the past two years as well with COVID is that, like, that there's an opportunity for the audience and the filmmaker to interact. Um, but the audience can often be shy to start off. So it's the programmer's role to really um, ease them into the proceedings and to have um, you know, um, good insights into the film to get people talking and to make the filmmaker uh, at ease as well. Okay. Emerging new talent is a big part of the FLA, but so too are established names, so it's great when they get to do things together. Oscar winner Olivia Coleman stars in Joyride, a film directed by Emer Reynolds. A group of film students went to see it and seemed to have been impressed. My name is Adley Kane, I'm from Wicklow and I'm here with the Young Critics Programme for the Galway Film Flat and uh, we got to see Joyride last night. Money, you need to come back now. I need that money. Money! Absolutely loved it. Um, it was really, it was just for the experience of actually coming to a film festival more so than anything. And I found that even throughout the heavier parts of this movie, there was a consistent like love in the atmosphere almost, which I thought made even the heavy parts more bearable. Um, I thought that uh, Olivia Coleman was excellent, and I thought her character in particular, Joy, um, it was just, it was brilliant to finally see or not finally, but to see more um, of a multi-dimensional female character introduced, as traditionally in film that can be something that isn't there a lot of the time. We get a good or a bad um, character, but it's not always a human character. If a plane's a 
Kat, you're going to come with me and help look after the baby. In return, I won't press charges. How is she there? She's fine. Well, how do you know if you won't check? Because you're giving me a little thumbs up. I think the whole theatre was, was able to, was laughing at, at, at moments, you know, and it didn't, there were moments that didn't take itself too seriously. And I think that really helped the story kind of come along in its own way. Um, and the serious moments to really have that effect as well. We were thinking about it and it was almost classically an, uh, very Irish in style. It had these, these, this Irish humour, these certain characters who you might see in, in Irish spaces. Um, maybe certain things that you might think were cliche, but they worked very well in this one. You're a mentalist. I'm practical and solution oriented. You just have to trust me. <gasps> I've got nothing with me, honest to goodness. I've left my face at the bottom of me, wash bag. There's a real buzz going into it. And I think you could even see from the, the programme with the people like, in charge of it, you could just see like there was such a, a buzz on the stage. It just like, nearly felt like you were going to watch a play more than anything else. Like, it felt like it be a live performance, but a film is obviously way more exciting. There was a Q&A after the directors, uh, the, direct, the director and the writers and the whole crew. And they said that they had talked through having multiple directors for the project. And, I think you could actually really see that because the film could so easily just be cookie cutter but it was all in the execution. I think they really like holding out to get the right director for that film is what made it for definite. Why are you going to draw me to visit someone, to give them something? You know how lucky you are to have had your mum. All that good stuff to pass on. She'll have you. Obviously very often the cinema you don't get to have your Q&A at the end. Um, but we had the director, Emer Reynolds, the writer, Alva Kyogen. Um, so I think it's always good to get a little bit of insight in as well if you want to do any critique of a film. We found found family a very big theme in this film. Uh, it was quite interesting to hear that the writer herself said that that wasn't one that stood out to her very strongly, uh, that she was kind of honing in more on motherhood. She doesn't want me, Molly. She won't even take a bottle from me. I just think that she doesn't want you. I hadn't heard anything about it. It wasn't until I, like, I turned up, I was like, oh, Olivia Coleman's in it. Um, but it was, it was really good. It's very interesting. It had this undeniable charm to it that was infectious all in the room, you know, and the humour in it as well was, was lovely. It was just, it was a really nice experience. I think there was a nice buzz in the air. I think because we, this is like, you know, the first time we were all back in, um, after COVID, it, it had something nice to it. And it was a good film to start off with, definitely, um, because it was so upbeat. This could be the making of you, John. One of the Irish-made films causing a real buzz this year is Lakelands. It's about a young GAA player whose life turns upside down after he's attacked on a night out. The directors are two Longford men, Robert Higgins and Patrick McGivney, and they spoke to Alistair Fish. Cool. So, Robert Higgins and Patrick McGivney, welcome. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having um, us. Patrick, uh, we'll start with you. Can you sure. tell us a bit about this film? Yeah, sure. Um, so this film's called Lakelands um, and it's about a GA club footballer um, called Kean who uh, gets attacked on a night out and um, over the course of the film he has to come to terms with the fact that he can no longer play GA. So it's kind of an exploration about, I suppose, having your identity wrapped up in something um, beyond your control. And um, I suppose as well as that, it's just, uh, I guess, a deep dive into small town culture in, in Midlands, Ireland. All right. And um, Robert, what attracted you to these like particular themes? Um, so I suppose we grew up in the place the film is set in Granard, uh, Longford. So we were always really intrigued with making a film set there, mm. and it was just always a very unique setting and very rich. And it also helped that uh, we had like the support of the townspeople yeah. there. And you know, when you're making your first feature, the more support you can get, the better. So that was sure. a big thing that tied in, and we just always felt uh, Midlands in particular. It's sometimes glossed over in the national discussion. So we're really eager just to dive into that and kind of explore the, the routines, the rituals and all that comes mm -hmm. with that in the, in yeah. the film, yeah. And uh, do you guys think maybe that's a part of why there's so much like interest uh, being generated about these films? Yeah, for what sure. I think the Midlands hasn't really been depicted uh, in film format. So um, I think that was a, a big motivation for us. And, 
you know, I think Midlands has got its own kind of unique culture, and I think you know there's there's universal, I guess, aspects to it. But um, I think that was definitely a driving force for us. We wanted to depict it and showcase it, and and, and show the rest of the culture, country what uh, what we're all about. I'm playing good ball, you know. People know me. And you never thought of leaving, even for a bit. And even uh, oh. in terms of. The GAA, we also found there was just a really unique little tread there to uh, to be explored, you know, that was a little bit different to how it's often kind of depicted on TV, you know, the kind of realities of it, you know, the cold <coughs> evenings in the dressing rooms, you know, <coughs> under floodlights, did it, just, it was a different world to ones that we experienced growing up and we kind of wanted to shine a light on that as well. Mm -hmm. And it ties into a lot of like social themes that are very kind of big at the moment. Um, like mental health and that kind of stuff. Uh, what, are we, what are you hoping to achieve in that yeah, regard? For sure, I think for us, you know, I think, you know, even just to, I guess, start a conversation to an extent. And um, I think just for young men in particular, just the importance of, I guess, just discussing what you're going through as you're going through it, you know, um, and just realizing that you have such a support network around you. Um, and I think, you know, the character Keen kind of goes on that journey and, I think, you know, towards the end of the film, he realises that he's had this support network kind of the whole time, you know, and he just hasn't really, I guess, used it or leveraged it um, the, the way he probably should have, you know. Yeah, like a big part for us was the idea that the character of Keane, he kind of has a, a hard shell which he's kind of used to navigate through the world. And when that's cracked when he ends up in the altercation and he's forced to kind of look inward and kind of deal with what's mm. there and kind of open up and that's when he really truly kind of discovers who he is on a deeper kind of level through it. You can't always choose how long these things last. All you can do is make the most of them while they're there. And um, the making of this film is deeply entwined with <coughs> the festival itself. So could you tell us a bit about that, that journey? Yeah, absolutely. So. Like we always had a good uh, relationship with Galway, even going back from our shorts, our drifting, drifting uh, screened here, our last short. And then last year, um, we took place in the marketplace and we, where we pitched Lakelands. And uh, we were lucky enough to uh, receive the Bankside Marketplace Award, which was just uh, an incredible boost for the project. You know, it was really instrumental in kind of helping us attract that bit of extra finance to kind of brought it into being a reality and being able to make mm -hmm. it also really helped us you know to get distributor on board which kind of legitimized us when we went to Screen Ireland then as well and you know it's it, with putting together a film you can't underestimate the importance of something like that yeah. just to legitimize it in the eyes of others. Yeah for sure and like even just getting access to so many market leaders and being able to get real-time feedback on the project like it gave us such a I guess a morale boost at a really critical time in the production and even just when we we're going out to actors then been able to say that you know we were winners of the bankside award it just definitely kind of just legitimized us that little bit more and and um, yeah it was it was really pivotal in the in the whole process without doubt all right great and when can we when can we expect to see this film uh, in the cinema so we're kind of going to be on the festival route for a little while but hopefully in the next uh maybe end of the year early next year it'd be when we're aiming for theatrical um, all right, we're well, looking forward to that. No, thank very you very much for being here. Cool. Thank thanks so much for having us. Four short films in this year's FLA feature stories about refugees. A common theme is what we miss about home. Family, friends and food. This is where Bas Bas, after it's left to rise, to rise for an hour or two, uh, it's cut up, it's a, a ruled with a rolling pin and then cut up into like squares or triangles, whatever. And after that, it's just deep fried. We screened four short documentaries today in the Town Hall Theatre. Um, they were about refugees, food, and coming to Ireland. We made these documentaries as UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, because we're constantly trying to show the Irish public how much refugees have to give, how much they have to offer, um, and the beauty that they bring to our country here in Ireland. So there are now 100 million people displaced worldwide, people that have been forced from their homes. Um, and behind this really shocking and heartbreaking number is people with lives just as full as mine or yours, with rights, with hopes and with wishes. Um, so that's what we're trying to do at UNHCR, is work to protect their lives and build a better future for them. So we saw everything from different types of 
bread, savory and sweet from Yemen. Um, we saw a gorgeous aubergine dish from Afghanistan. Um, we actually cooked goat on St. Tola's goat farm um, with um, Bengali from Guinea. Um, and we saw a wide variety of bit of everything. And we also got to showcase local Irish producers as we did that. So we got to make people's home cuisine with Irish producers and on Irish farms. Uh, my name is Bengali. I'm from Guinea in West Africa. And now I'm working in a Shannon Spring Hotel as a sous chef. My contribution was to the film. It was, it was uh, just to show how um, we come to Ireland, how did we progress. And they saw it, my story in the news, and then they contacted me to see if I can go and cook something for the local farmers. So but, uh, I went to prove to them and then uh, make some cooking on it and the uh, rice and then uh, they love it, they eat it, they really know that you can eat, you can have uh, goat meat. A lot of some people can't afford to buy like bread pre-made sometimes, it's just cheaper to make it at home and you know there's always different types of bread. Uh, so that people could eat. Hi, my name's Jess Murphy. I'm the owner of Kai Restaurant here in Galway and I'm a high profile UNHCR ambassador. So my involvement in the four documentaries was really getting to different communities together and cooking with them and really embracing that universal uh, language, which is food for all of us. Um, I think what inspired me to make the documentary and to work work so heavily with the UNHCR and with food is that you know to bring communities together to show one another that we're not so different after all like the smell of tomatoes is the same smell of tomatoes in New Zealand and Goa in Nigeria as it is in Palestine so um, you know we are different but we're all not so different and you know it's it's that universal thing that you always miss about home is your mum and dad you know like it was their family the only thing I would like to add is to believe yourself. Uh, you need to believe yourself. You need to love what you're doing. Uh, nothing is impossible. Everything is possible if you want to do so. There is always room for the unusual and original at the Galway Film Fla. Cork artist Aideen Barry has made a striking black and white non-verbal film using stop motion technology and set in Lithuania. She explained that original approach to our reporter, Graden Aikens, and talked about the joys of filming in Eastern Europe. I'm here with Aideen Barry. Aideen, thank you for your time. Uh, just to begin, could you tell us a bit about the film, what it's about, and kind of the process of like how you made it? Okay, so the film is called Clustus, which means folds or pleats. And it was a commission from CONUS 2022, which was the European Capital of Culture. They invited me to the city to make a work in collaboration with nearly a thousand Lithuanian uh, citizens um, to make a kind of an interpretation of their really unusual architectural heritage and to motivate uh, the citizens of Lithuania to feel passionate about their architecture. So the film is actually created like a series of vignettes or short films, one story going into another story going into another story. So, yeah. A little bit like the folds of the title. Exactly, just like a pleat. But um, it was also kind of uh, inspired by Italiano Calvino's City of Ideas. So I approached 50 short story writers to construct the, I suppose, the the scaffolding of the stories about the these interwar period buildings and then I built the script around and the storyboards around what we were going to make out of these short stories so it really involved a kind of a, a great collaboration with all of these different types of artists in multidisciplinary kind of ways. What was it like what, what about the architecture in particular drew you into that was that 
Was that part of the, the request that it was about the architecture of the city, or was that something that kind of came about through the process of getting to know uh, Conus better? So when I was first invited to Conus, I couldn't get over how I'd never heard of it. Because you go there and it's like an architectural wonderland of what we would consider art deco, but they call mm -hmm. interwar modernism. And it's these incredible buildings that were uh, constructed between 1919 and 1939. Hence why they call it this interwar modernism. Um, but most of the architects were Jewish. And unfortunately, by 1939, when the Nazis invaded the city, those architects were uh, killed in the Holocaust. And a lot of the understanding or the knowledge around the origin, origins of this architecture were kind of lost. So I thought this was such an interesting thing to try and rediscover it. The film itself is, is very uh, striking. It's shot in black and white and there's a lot of stop motion animation. And I was mm. wondering if you tell me a bit about the process of coming to kind of those decisions of how you wanted to shoot it, whether that was something you came in with that uh, visual in mind or whether that's came through the process of collaborating with the citizens of Conus. Firstly, I was thinking about that time period of 1990 and 1939 and what the kind of film styles would have been in that kind of almost silent movie era of film style. So I was looking at a lot of the film makers of that period, Lithuanian filmmakers and Russian filmmakers of that period. But also I was thinking about my own, inter my own experience of Eastern European filmmaking. In the 1980s in Ireland, we had no access to um, like I suppose world cinema, but um, our national broadcaster brought in a lot of Eastern European films which used the stop motion kind of style. Now what we didn't realize was they were kind of political films that were kind of emerged out of censorship under the Soviet machine at the time, but that style really influenced me. So it was like almost something coming full circle, being able to go back to Eastern Europe, bringing that influence of this style of, of filmmaking, experimental filmmaking, and bringing it into the process. Obviously, these, a lot of this architecture was built, as you said, in like 1919 to 1939, and this was a sort of extremely volatile period, especially in mm. Eastern Europe. Was there, um, how did you sort of learn uh, or, or connect with that history through this piece? Was there a lot of sort of trying to connect with that period and how it influenced and shaped uh, Konos today? Firstly, I kind of worked with architectural historians and historians in the locale. So they gave me a huge insight into the whole, I suppose, heritage and the roots of where these buildings kind of emerged from. But also I was really fortunate to work with some more senior citizens of Conus and people who had actually lived through World War II as children. And they gave me their stories about how they survived invasion and occupation, which has such a lovely and also tragic relationship to what we're experiencing now with the war in Ukraine. So a lot of Lithuanians would be all too familiar with invasion and those experiences and it has left a lot of trauma and PTSD. And so working with the citizens, I was able to tease out those stories and really respectfully involve them in the process. So they had a kind of, they consented to their stories being allowed and used in those narrations and of scenes. Perfect. Aideen, thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much. Films made in the Irish language will always have a special place in the Galway Fla, and this year is no exception. Rosha and Frank is one such film. I spoke to co-director Peter Murphy about a story which is unusual to say the least. It's just on watching the high shulogy, Rosha. So, Peter Murphy, thank you, and you're very welcome here. Thanks. So, firstly, if you just want to let us know a little bit about the film. So, the film is Rosh Frank. It's Frank. Uh, it's about, um, it's Oscar Ilga. Uh, so, it's one of the Cine Cahar uh, scheme films uh, done through um, TG Cahar, Screen Ireland, and BAI. And it's about a woman uh, who is grieving the loss of her husband, who died uh, a few years earlier, and she's lost in grief when we meet her in the film. And a dog appears at her back door, a stray dog, and she realizes over a period of time, not long, 
that it's, it's her husband who's come back to help her move on. Give me that. To, uh, to deal with loss, and that's essentially the film. And as the film progresses, everyone gets into it. Her local community get taken away on this, this kind of fairy tale of her husband returning, and the only uh, people who are struggling with it are her, her, her neighbour who has uh, designs on her and her son who thinks it's all a bit mad. So, um, going into it, did you kind of want to keep the tone, like balance out the, the light with the dark? Yeah, the tone was, I think it was the number one issue we had with it, was trying to get tone right. Tonally, it's quite a, uh, it was quite a tricky one all the way through from scripting, uh, shooting and in post, right up to our editor talking to us about it going, it, it's, it's all about tone. And I know it's, something, it's kind of thing people say, but tone was the real thing to manage because we wanted to have light moments, but we also knew there are, and there are scenes in it that are very uh, emotional. And it is essentially a film about grief but it's also been described in places as a, a canine comedy. So it's, I think we've, we've achieved that. We're really delighted actually with Tonally how it's landing because we've had people at festivals come, to say, come up and say to us, myself and Rachel, my co-writer and co-director, that you've, you've got something magical that makes you uh, laugh and cry. And it, it was really trying to get that tone, tone right because it could have been, it could have gone too far either way and not worked. And I, I think we've achieved it, but that was a real conversation for us throughout the process was getting tone right. Mm. Yeah, even from the clips that I've seen, you, uh, it seems to strike that balance perfectly. It's great. Yeah, I think it does. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of um, the Irish language, are you a Gwilgor yourself? Or? I'm not a Gwilgor. I, I mean, I think my Irish is, is strong. I, I certainly I work quite a bit through Irish. Uh, I don't use it in everyday, in everyday life. But uh, Rachel, who I co-write and co-direct with, is, is, Leif, is a fluent Irish speaker and uh, was educated through Irish. And uh, our producer is a native speaker and uh, obviously the cast. And actually, I, I'm always surprised, I always say to people, you'd be amazed by how much uh, Irish you have as an Irish person. I mean, I know we all talk about... Cupola Focal. Yeah, but actually you have way more than a Cupola Focal. It's funny, we have a lot of people, and it is, it's kind of an attitude thing. You have people who come in on crew who are very into it and kind of go, okay, I've just done it in school, but... Uh, you know, I, I, I understand more than I can speak. And it's amazing how often people say that. So I, I was very pleased. I mean, I did some uh, courses. I went up to Glencom, Kill up in Donegal to do, uh, you know, courses to improve my Irish and strengthen it. But actually, I think I was impressed uh, by how much the crew could actually speak and get it and understand it. I think mm. we have a lot more Irish than we realize. Obviously, there are quite a few people on, on, on set who are absolutely fluent and speak it as their native language both crew and cast, and obviously almost all of the cast are either fluent or, or native speakers. Mm. Now, in terms of obstacles, they say don't shoot with kids or dogs. So how did that go? I would say shoot with kids and dogs as much as you can. It was fantastic. I mean, it was that was kind of the amazing thing. Yeah, people say don't shoot with children and animals. Both worked out amazingly. I mean, the kids were great. Kids were, were uh, you know, we didn't, actually one of the best people on the set was, was, uh, was our, uh, our two-year-old who was, who was also our coach, the hurling coach's daughter. She just said at one point, oh, you've got a, a kid in it, why don't you use my kid? And she was amazing. She was so chilled out and so relaxed. Uh, you know, there was times when she was definitely the easiest person on set. And the young kids were all great, very into it and really enjoyed it. But the big challenge obviously was working with uh, a dog. We'd never worked with, you know, not significantly worked with. I think one of our shorts, we'd done a little bit with a dog, but nothing on this scale. And we had to go to the UK to find our, uh, our dog. Your star. Our star. And we realized when we were trying to, we, at one point we went through the script going, let's work out how many scenes we have the dog in. And then we realized we'd be quicker working out how many scenes the dog is not in because because Barley, who ultimately was our was our uh, our dog, was in pretty much everything. So there was no one really here doing it at that level anymore. The company who worked, it was a great Irish company, but they'd sort of said to us, we don't really have a dog ready to do this. And they weren't uh, doing it as much anymore. So we went to the UK, found this great company. Jill, uh, Jill in the UK was, was uh, someone we found so we went over to her, she, she looked at the script and said, we've only one dog that can make this film. <laughs> and they, they also looked at the script and said, we don't know what a sly otar is, because obviously we'd written Schlitter yeah. for, for a hurling ball, as we weirdly have to call it in, in the uh, subtitles. 
but they said we don't know what a slide tower is but it sounds like it might be a ball that's going to be the one area that's going to be problematic because uh, they were saying when when barley sees the slide tower he's going to go crazy so there were little tricks we had to do around that like literally when the when the slitter came out barley just got unbelievably excited so there were challenges we had to do certain plate shots to make sure that it looked like the ball was been hit and the dog was calmly looking at it but so at the beginning the very first day of the shoot our um our ad said we've got to figure out whether we can shoot this film or not because if the dog can't do what the dog has to do we need to you know have a plan b so we set up a very elaborate wide shot with a with uh, barley our dog coming in and looking for the slit there actually as it turns out there's a scene where he comes into a room at night and looks around the bedroom uh, uh to find the slitter and it was quite amazing that he set it up. We rolled a uh, call to action, dog comes in, and being cued by our amazing Ash, who was our amazing uh, handler, who was over with us from the UK, and just sent the dog to the different spots in the room just by little simple hand signals. And amazing. there was a sigh of relief amongst the crew. We can make the movie. It's gonna work. It's gonna work. I mean, like, yeah. Bar so Barley was, yeah, Barley was incredible. He's a rescue dog, uh, so that's what she always, uh, Jill always gets rescue dogs, trains them up, and then lives, so Barley is also a, a pet, has, lives a, a life with a family. Now, we all find that kind of amazing that he's a, he's a, he's a family pet. <coughs> Who just gets taken Takes away a every holiday, yeah, a gets a holiday and, and Ash, who's our trainer, was going, every time I go, I think it's been too long. Barley hasn't been on set before. He's living the life of Riley as a family dog, he's not gonna be able to do it. And he says every time he hits set, it's just like the pro. He just is absolutely so he's incredible, yeah. Ah, that's fantastic. So if you get a dog like that, I would say work with animals. It was it was incredible, yeah. That's great. And I suppose finally, how does it feel to have it at the Galway Film Flat? It's brilliant. We had our, our, our traders, our our first feature was a Galway as well. And uh, we've had at least two of our shorts in Galway, certainly Waterloo Dentures. I think Swag was here as well. So we've had two shorts and our first feature, and every experience is always amazing at Galway. Great audience, it's great, you know, it's a fun festival, obviously. So we're delighted to be able to have it here. You know, we've always we've always had good experience down here, and and yeah, it's 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 just always a buzz. It always feels like everyone down here is is loving the experience and loving film, and it's it's back as a full, real, you know, in person festival. So that makes it even more special. It's great. That's great. Thank you so much, Peter. Thanks, Anna. That's great. Okay. A kaleidoscope cruise through Dublin's queer underbelly. That's what's promised by a new film called Shame Less. The team behind it believes the LGBTQ plus community needs to be wary of the mainstream. So the film was based off of, uh, initially off a report that uh, Dr. Thomas Strong, who's a friend of ours uh, with the anthropology department in Maynooth, um, he, he'd written this report about gay male sexual worlds and sexual culture in Ireland today and he approached me during the lockdown uh, to see whether I'd be interested in responding to the report with some funding that had become available to him. When we were in pre-production we were having a lot of discussions about content and you know how it was all going to come together but then when we were shooting it there was you know there was a lot of a lot of things that felt like they were left up to chance. The, the, the challenges, the, the kind of creative challenges that we faced after that were, were to do with, you know, how the whole thing would sit together and, and feel cohesive. I thought it would be interesting to, you know, to shoot a film about gay male sexual culture in the Boiler House sauna in, uh, in Dublin city centre. Yeah, and absolutely, it's a venue it's certainly known to, to gay, bi men, and men who have sex with men, uh, probably around the world in Ireland, because there's, there's very few saunas left. Um, but we also wanted to make use of that space, uh, and maybe show it in a different way, and sort of have fun with it in, in a way. And also a place that, um, you know, we wouldn't have been able to shoot in otherwise, had it not been for the lockdown. Pride is a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, Interestingly, what's happened with Dublin Pride is now there is, you know, uh, a, a, a 
protest, um, a, a kind of radical queer protest that happens concurrently to the parade itself. If I'd rather it wasn't family friendly than, than, than the other way around. So, you know, if they want to have their parties, that's fine, but that's not where it came from. <clears throat> but for me personally, Pride is always a protest and it should show all sorts of different subcultures within our community and kinks and everything else. They were there first before families, to be honest. I have my own opinions about what Pride is for me, but they may not necessarily be the same as what the other ad car might think about, you know, Pride. I think, you know, Pride is a movable feast. It's a lot of different things to a lot of different people. It's amazing in this country the leaps and bounds that we've made in terms of legislation, in terms of social attitudes. Um, obviously the marriage equality referendum was a big kind of milestone for a lot of people. But obviously there's some sort of backlash and pushback and that's always there, so we still sort of need to be vigilant. I think it's ongoing and it will be for a long time. I think there's space for both of those things to happen and maybe to kind of disagree with each other at the same time. Music almost always plays a huge part in cinema and in our lives in general. One film celebrates that by focusing on one pub in Doolin, County Clare. The Job of Songs is a look at a community which wants and needs traditional Irish music sessions. Director Lila Schmidt has professional and personal reasons for travelling that road. Important as I'm saying, but without it we have nothing. Nothing. I'd go out and I'd be the life and soul of the party. You know, in the end, like, I'd go home and I'd just be quiet. I'm here with Lila Schmitz. Lila, thank you for your time. Thanks for having me. Uh, just to begin, I was wondering if you could tell me a bit about what the movie's about and what inspired you to make this film. Sure. Um, the Job of Songs is the name of the film, and it's a documentary about musicians in County Clare, and it's about community and how people come together around music. And I made the film um, inspired by coming here to visit relatives who my ancestors emigrated to the U.S. And so um, we had come to meet cousins who live in County Kerry and um, were traveling about. And I stepped into a session and was just totally overcome by this feeling that came about with the music and sort of all of these people coming together to exist in space and create something and um, just feeling that and so that feeling stuck with me and I couldn't describe it I still can't really and so the film is an attempt to describe that. What did you find about especially the the people and the people making the music uh, talking to them interviewing them that really spoke to you? Sure I mean everything they're fascinating they they I think taught me about feeling through their art and they were so um, willing to share sort of the philosophy and the emotion and all of these different takes on what the music really meant to them. How did you, um, how did you, did you find that, you know, you, you came here uh, trying to meet cousins and you have ancestry here. Did you find that uh, your connection to that ancestry or your sort of understanding of it, did that deepen through the process of, you know, seeing a lot of Irish music and being here for the Yeah, film? yeah, I think it's interesting because yes, and also I've heard from people who are watching the film that there's this sense of nostalgia about the music, whether they have ancestors here or not. And so I think there's something that's really special about the people coming together and just feeling so connected and ingrained through this music that's passed through the generations and like just through human connection and existence. And so I think there is some ancestral connection that definitely helps it along, but I, have, but I think that it's not just that. I think there's something even broader than the sort of specific heritage piece of it. So in it, and it was afterwards, they were like, oh, you are lucky you were here for this because it was just this magic of like something overcame everyone and it all just went together. 
Um, so, I mean, I don't have a favorite child, uh, you know, <laughs> of the songs, but um, I, I just, I think that they all are so representative of the individual, and so I could never, I, you know, I, I couldn't pick a favorite, but um, I, I love that they are unique to, to the artist. One big uh, um, thing to the film is that there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of scenes of music and people uh, in pubs and stuff like that, but there's also a lot of scenes of silence and people in their homes sort of examining like isolation and loneliness and how those two things contrast. I was wondering if you could tell me a bit more about yeah. the film. Sure, I think for me, looking at this sort of like community that's so deep in the pubs and in the music and then seeing the landscapes that are so just open and isolating and um, the small communities that are both very connected. And Was there any particular difficulties, uh, especially anything that you may not have kind of foreseen when you started this process? We didn't know we were going to make a feature. So um, I would say that that definitely introduced a lot more than what we thought we were going to do. We came and, and sort of thought we were going to make a short film. And while we were shooting, we were like, this is probably not a short film. <laughs> There's, it was so rich. Um, but we really came and just started talking to people. And the only reason that it became a feature is because the musicians and music lovers who spoke to us were so open and willing. Lyle Schmitz, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. That's it for now for the film Flat TV. We'll be back tomorrow and Sunday night with more film, interviews and a bit of crack too. Slongerfall. Important as I'm saying, but without it we have nothing.